ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everybody, please have a seat. Have a seat. Um, before I get started, uh, can we get the new presidential set up out here? It's worked before. <laughs> That's more like it. It is great to be back. What a year, huh? I usually start these dinners with a few self-deprecating jokes. After my stellar 2013, what could I possibly talk about? <laughs> I admit it, last year was rough. Sheesh. <laughs> at, at one point, things got so bad, the 47% called Mitt Romney to apologize. <laughs> of course, we rolled out healthcare.gov. That could have gone better. In 2008, my slogan was, yes, we can. In 2013, my slogan was, control, alt, delete. <laughs> On the plus side, they did turn the launch of healthcare.gov into one of the year's biggest movies. But rather than dwell on the past, I would like to pivot to this dinner. Let's welcome our headliner this evening, Joel McHale. On Community, Joel plays a preening, self-obsessed narcissist. So this dinner must be a real change of pace for you. I want to thank the White House Correspondents Association for hosting us here tonight. Uh, I am happy to be here, uh, even though I am a little jet-lagged from my trip to Malaysia. The lengths we have to go to to get CNN coverage these days. <laughs> I think they're still searching for their table. MSNBC is here. They're a little overwhelmed. They've never seen an audience this big before. <laughs> but look, everybody is trying to keep up with this incredibly fast-changing media landscape. For example, I got a lot of grief on cable news for promoting Obamacare to young people uh, on Between Two Ferns. Uh, but that's what young people like to watch. And to be fair, I am not the first person on television between two potted plants. Sometimes I do feel disrespected by you reporters, but that's okay. Seattle Seahawk cornerback Richard Sherman is here tonight, and he gave me he gave me some great tips on how to handle it. Jake Tapper, don't you ever talk about me like that. I'm the best president in the game. What do you think, Richard? Was that good? A little more feeling next time?
While we're talking sports, just last month, uh, a wonderful story, an American won the Boston Marathon for the first time in 30 years. <laughs> Which was inspiring, uh, and only fair since a Kenyan has been president for the last six. <laughs> to even things out. <laughs> we have some other athletes here tonight, including Olympic snowboarding gold medalist Jamie Anderson is here. We're proud of her. Incredibly talented young lady. Michelle and I watch the Olympics. We cannot believe what these folks do. Death-defying feats. Haven't seen somebody pull a 180 that fast since Rand Paul disinvited that Nevada rancher from this dinner. <laughs> As a general rule, things don't uh, end well if the sentence starts, let me tell you something I know about the Negro. <laughs> You don't really need to hear the rest of it. Just a tip for you. Don't start your sentence that way. <laughs> Speaking of Rand Paul, legalized marijuana this year, uh, an interesting social experiment. Uh, I do hope it doesn't lead to a whole lot of paranoid people who think that the federal government's out to get them and <laughs> listening to their phone calls. That would be a problem. <laughs> and speaking of conservative heroes, the Koch brothers bought a table here tonight. But, as usual, they used a shadowy right-wing organization as a front. Hello, Fox News. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. Let's face it, Fox, you'll miss me when I'm gone. <laughs> it will be harder to convince the American people that Hillary was born in Kenya. A lot of us really are concerned about the way big money is influencing our politics. I remember when a super PAC was just me buying Marlboro 100s instead of regulars. <laughs> of course, now that it's 2014, Washington is obsessed on the midterms. Folks are saying that with my sagging poll numbers, my fellow Democrats don't really want me campaigning with them. And I don't think that's true, although I did notice the other day that uh, Sasha needed a speaker at career day and she invited Bill Clinton. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was a little hurt by that. <laughs> Both sides are doing whatever it takes to win. It's a ruthless game. Republicans. <laughs> This is a true story. Republicans actually brought in a group of consultants to teach their candidates how to speak to women. This is true. Uh, and I don't know if it'll work with women, but I understand that America's teenage boys are signing up to run for the Senate in droves. <laughs> anyway, while you guys focus on the horse race, I'm going to do what I do. I'm going to be focused on everyday Americans. Just yesterday, I read a heartbreaking letter. Uh, you know, I get letters from uh, folks around the country every day. I get 10 that I read. This, this one got to me. A Virginia man who's been stuck in the same part-time job for years, no respect from his boss, no chance to get ahead. Uh, I, I really wish Eric Cantor would stop writing me. <laughs> You can just pick up the phone, Eric. 
And I'm feeling sorry, believe it or not, for the Speaker of the House as well. These days, the House Republicans actually give John Boehner a harder time than they give me. Uh, which means orange really is the new black. <laughs> given up the idea of working with Congress. In fact, two weeks ago, Senator Ted Cruz and I, we uh, got a bill done together. And, and I have to say, the signing ceremony was something special. Got a picture of it, I think. I, I, look, I know, Washington seems more dysfunctional than ever. Gridlock has gotten so bad in this town, you have to wonder, what do we do to piss off Chris Christie so bad? <laughs> One issue, for example, we haven't been able to agree on is unemployment insurance. Republicans continue to refuse to extend it. Uh, you know what, I, I am beginning to think they've got a point. If you want to get paid while not working, you should have to run for Congress just like everybody else. <laughs> of course, there is one thing that keeps Republicans busy. They have tried more than 50 times to repeal Obamacare. Despite that, 8 million people signed up for health care in the first open enrollment. <laughs> Which does lead one to ask, how well does Obamacare have to work before you don't want to repeal it? What if everybody's cholesterol drops to one <laughs> What if your yearly checkup came with tickets to a Clippers game? Not, not the old Don Sterling Clippers, the new Oprah Clippers. <laughs> Would that be good enough? What if it gave Mitch McConnell a pulse? <laughs> what is it going to take? <laughs> anyway, this year I've promised to use more executive actions to get things done without Congress. My critics call this the imperial presidency. Truth is, I just show up every day at my office and do my job. Got a picture of this, I think. <laughs> you would think they'd appreciate a more assertive approach considering that the new conservative darling is none other than Vladimir Putin. Last year, Pat Buchanan said Putin's headed straight for the Nobel Peace Prize. He said this. Now, I know it sounds crazy, uh, but to be fair, they give those to just about anybody these days. <laughs> so it could happen. But it's not just uh, Pat. Rudy Giuliani said Putin is what you call a leader. Mike Huckabee and Sean Hannity keep talking about his bare chest, which is kind of weird. <laughs> Look it up, they talk about it a lot. <laughs> it is strange to think that I have just two and a half years left in this office. Um, everywhere I look, there are reminders that I only hold this job temporarily. <laughs> but uh, it's a long time between now and 2016, and anything can happen. You may have heard the other day Hillary had to dodge a flying shoe at a press conference. <laughs> I love that picture. <laughs> Regardless of what happens, I've run my last campaign, 
and I'm beginning to think about my legacy. Uh, some of you know Mayor Rahm Emanuel recently announced he's naming a high school after me in Chicago, which is extremely humbling. Uh, I was even more flattered to hear Rick Perry, who's here tonight, is doing the same thing in Texas. Take a look. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. It means a lot to me. And I intend to enjoy all the free time that I will have. George W. Bush took up painting after he left office, which inspired me to take up my own artistic side. I, I, I'm sure we've got a shot of this. Maybe not. The joke doesn't work without the slide. Oh well. Assume that it was funny. Does this happen to you, Joe? <laughs> it does, okay. On a more serious note, uh, tonight reminds us that we really are lucky to live in a country where reporters get to give a head of state a hard time on a daily basis, and then once a year give him or her the chance, at least, to try to return the favor. Uh, but we also know that not every journalist or photographer or crew member is so fortunate. Because even as we celebrate uh, the free press tonight, our thoughts are with those in places around the globe, like Ukraine and Afghanistan and Syria and Egypt, who risk uh, everything, in some cases even give their lives, to report the news. And what tonight also reminds us is that the fight for full and fair access goes beyond the chance to ask a question. Uh, as Steve mentioned, decades ago, an African-American who wanted to cover his or her president might be barred from journalism school, burdened by Jim Crow, and once in Washington, banned from press conferences. Uh, but after years of effort, black editors and publishers began meeting with FDR's press secretary, Steve Early. And then they met with the president himself, who declared that a black reporter would get a credential. Uh, and even when Harry McAlpin made history as the first African-American to attend a presidential news conference, he wasn't always welcomed by the other reporters. But he was welcomed by the president, who told him, I'm glad to see you, McAlpin, and I'm very happy to have you here. Now, that uh, sentiment might have worn off once Harry asked him a question or two. Uh, and Harry's battles continued, but he made history. And we're so proud of uh, Sherman uh, and his family for being here tonight, and the White House Correspondents Association for creating the scholarship in Harry's name. For over 100 years, even as the White House Correspondents Association has told the story of America's progress, you've lived it too, gradually allowing equal access to women, and minorities, and gays, and Americans with disabilities. And yes, radio and television and internet reporters as well. And through it all, you've helped make sure that even as societies change, our fundamental commitment to the interaction between those who govern and those who ask questions uh, doesn't change. And as Jay will attest, it's a legacy you carry on enthusiastically every single day. Uh, and because this is the 100th anniversary of the Correspondent Association, uh, I actually recorded uh, an additional brief video thanking all of you for your hard work. Can we run the video? Congratulations. Congratulations. What's going on? I, I, I was told this would work. Uh, does anybody know how to fix this? Oh, thank you. You got it? I see it all the time. There. That's Congratulations to the White House Correspondents Association. Here's to 100 <laughs> more terrific years. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. And God bless America, and thank you, Kathleen Sebelius.
I think the enduring principle remains that we exist and we work to keep the eyes of a free press on the government and on the president. Sometimes you don't like the decisions I make and sometimes I don't like the way you write about the decisions. Our role is very much on the ground. I view the association as basically the shop steward for correspondents. You're there to help them do their job. We deal with a lot of logistics. We're the ones working on who has a seat in the briefing room, who's in the press pool at the Oval Office, in the motorcade, in the plane. That's beautiful. You see the hot tub? <laughs> One of the great things about our job is being there when history is being made. The evolution of the presidency has gone hand in hand with the evolution of the White House Press Association and the relationship of the press to politics. The White House correspondents perform a vital service in letting folks know what the White House is all about. Did you make a mistake in sending arms to Tehran, sir? No, and I'm not taking any more questions. I always try to put myself in their position. They had a difficult job to do, and they needed a new story every day. And if I didn't give them one, they'd have one anyway, and it would sometimes it'd be one I didn't like, but it was all part of the deal. With every president, the relationship is constantly changing, but there is an unchanging quest for the Correspondents Association, and it's a simple word. Access. 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 We have to continue to press for those doors and windows to remain open so you can see and see the account of history from an unbiased view. We're not through this period where there's a great contest between people who believe in the free exchange of ideas and the freedom of the press and the freedom to argue back. We can't go back to a more polarized world where somebody can put the hammer down and this is the way it's gonna be and you can't say anything differently. If you try to, I'll cut you off or put you in jail. People have to be informed or otherwise they're not gonna support their government. What's the matter with these clowns? There's always going to be governments that try to be a little bit more insulated. It's important to push back on that. The Correspondents Association is a good forum for reminding all reporters that they also work for the public, that they also have a responsibility to the American people. The press is an institutional part of the White House, and it should always be an institutional part. Every government needs a watchdog. We never win, we never lose. It's just a constant struggle. My best moment here is when my press conference ended. <laughs> Like so many of the struggles inside the Beltway, this one started as a turf battle in 1914 on Capitol Hill. All the press conferences in those days were dominated by the violence in Mexico, the Mexican Revolution. There was no controls on who attended those press conferences. And the Standing Committee of Correspondence in Congress tried to move in on the White House. They wanted to become the one that would help President Woodrow Wilson start having regular press conferences and selecting who would attend. A select group of journalists of White House Correspondents Association was formed. Looking back a hundred years and seeing the pictures and hearing the history, it's amazing how things have evolved. The organization was started by a group of white men, not women, not minorities, a group of white men. It was Franklin Roosevelt who was the first president to allow a black White House correspondent into a presidential press conference. In February 1944, journalist Harry McAlpin broke down the barriers of inequality, becoming the first African-American White House correspondent. And it's in his honor that the Correspondents Association has established the Harry S. McAlpin Jr. Scholarship for young and aspiring journalists. We always had women members, and we had women in the press conferences and on the beat, but we wouldn't let them attend our dinner. The general attitude was that this was a stag event. This was for men only. It was a little too bawdy for women. It was this sense that women journalists almost didn't belong. They weren't part of the boys' club. It wasn't until three women reporters, including Helen Thomas in 1962, went to John F. Kennedy and said, we'd like you to help us get into this dinner. Kennedy sent a simple message. Tell them I'm not attending the dinner next year unless women are allowed to attend. All of a sudden, it changed. And how did it change? Uh, we do nothing but body jokes now. Three Hillary's. That sounds like President Clinton's worst nightmare. <laughs> and while 99% of the correspondent's job is working the beat, there is one night a year when serious Washington can make fun of itself. The White House Correspondent's Dinner. We started the dinner in the, in the 20s. They've done this before? Of course, it wasn't televised, and it didn't have Hollywood celebrities. 
We did have entertainers. We'd have animal acts or jugglers. You're not gonna be able to top that. There have been somebody doing, and I, gee, wish I were there, animal impressions. Now we have one entertainer, the President Association fixed entertainer. I was toying with the idea of having a juggler. Doesn't get much more exciting than that. And what is the key to navigating the icy and sometimes treacherous waters of Washington humor? I'm gonna wing it. Winging it. Improvise a lot. Just see what happens. There's basically three models. One is people who do the politics and get it right. That's rare. Well, is there anyone that I'm excited to roast tonight? Well, if Putin's there, that'll be a real big deal. People who try to do the politics and get it wrong, that's painful. Boy, I could say something really dirty, but I probably shouldn't. And then there's people who just avoid the politics, like the plague. I'm, I'm not a political comedian. Am I a political guy? Yes, I am definitely into politics. That's why I work at the E! Network. Washington comedy is unlike any other comedy. You're supposed to keep it clean. You're supposed to keep it self-deprecating. In 1945, you had Frank Sinatra, Danny Thomas, Jimmy Durante, Fanny Bryce. This year, it's me. <laughs> Did you know that the president will be there? Yeah, the president will be there. Of the United States. Yeah, and not only that, he's opening for you. And it's not only the place for an entertainer to shine. It's the place where a president can bring down the house, giving as good as he gets. Known as the prom of Washington, D.C., a term coined by political reporters who clearly never had the chance to go to an actual prom. Presidents will immediately think, well, this is a chance to make fun of the press. And it just goes with the territory. That's not what you do. You go make fun of yourself. You got to show them you can take it. It's not easy to do stand-up comedy at one of these dinners. I thought they were fun. I look forward to them. Jay Leno's here. <laughs> Together, we give hope to gray-haired, chunky baby boomers everywhere. We don't want people insulted. We want people to be teased. God knows Washington can use a little teasing. But don't make fun of the press, because they can't take it. They're thin-skinned, and they don't want to hear it. Laughter aside, the first and foremost mission of the Correspondents Association Dinner is to promote journalism education through the scholarship fund. Your attendance tonight allows us to give back to these students. We appreciate it. As this dinner has grown and grown over the years, it's actually generated more revenue for this very important scholarship. Obviously, the main reason we're there is for the scholarships and to help these young people. They're all remarkable, talented folks, full of energy and the kind of people that you want to see going into journalism. We want to welcome Curtis McLeod, Having something like this scholarship, it gives them hope to say, wow, there is a resource for me, there is something I can go to. The WHCA really provided such an unforgettable experience for me. It was such a tremendous honor, and uh, I'm really thankful to them for the scholarship and for that experience. There's still a future in journalism. It's going through a lot of changes, but there'll still be a need for people to cover the White House and the government. I hope it'll be around for another 100 years. I think the dinner has probably done a lot more good than people think. Whether it's Twitter, or the typewriter, the Correspondents Association continues to deliver its message, covering the White House, standing sentry, sending out the news in an ever-changing media landscape. Year in, year out, we've dealt with a lot of changes on this beat. We've seen the start of radio. We see the advent of television and press conferences, first by Eisenhower, then by John F. Kennedy. We've seen the advent of the internet as a tool in the Clinton years. The White House had a telephone system that had been there since President Carter. Hello, what do you want? Now we've seen social media. That's exploded in the last four or five years. Well, one thing I often like to say is that speed kills, because we just are racing faster and faster to get raw information in front of the public. It's created a situation where reporters are under such stress and pressure from their editors to get it fast, get it first. Reporters can't pause, reporters can't wait. They can't digest anymore. They can't be as thorough as they used to be. But from the point of view of the reader, the main thing is, is it accurate? Now we're dealing with multiple time zones. Everything is in real time, and we're all working faster trying to produce more. The questions we ask are still the same. I think it's important that there's a hodgepodge of voices of reporters here because it's not just all about that one story. It's about various stories around the world and in this nation, and that brings together this one group. I hope that 100 years from now, when we're celebrating the next anniversary of our association, we'll still have a room here at the White House with people asking the president or his staff questions every day 
and then explaining it to people. The dissemination of the news will change, the media will change, but I think the journalism will not change. This is a great window in the world. What's absolutely clear is, is that our democracy doesn't work unless we've got a strong fourth estate. If you don't have that interaction, then you don't really have a true democracy. Even if I don't always admit it, I appreciate that they're there. I want to take a, just an extra second on that and thank Nancy Dubuque, who's the CEO of the a and &E Networks. <laughs> Their crews uh, worked on this for months uh, at no cost out of our scholarship fund, and it was a great service to our association. I want to thank Diane Sawyer, who kindly agreed to do the voiceover for us. I want to thank uh, Politico and Life who lent us some of their photos. And I want to thank our colleagues who participated, all of the press secretaries who agreed to be interviewed, and particularly Presidents Obama and Clinton who agreed to be interviewed for that. Thank you very much. I want to talk for a minute uh, just about the state of play. I want to thank my family, my wife Denise, my sons Jack, Jim, and Ryan for all their help and support, particularly this last year, but for the last 25. I want to thank the McClatchy Company. I want to thank our CEO, Pat Talamantis, our Washington Bureau, and their commitment to public interest journalism both here in Washington and around the world allows us to keep doing some work uh, that, that needs to be done. I want to thank my colleagues, uh, particularly Leslie Clark and Anita Kumar, and Barb Barrett and David Goldstein, because they've basically covered it while I turned this job into a full-time job, and they've done all the briefings and the travel that I, I haven't been able to do, and I couldn't have done this without them. I want to thank this board. Our board is a terrific group of people. The vast majority of their work you never see. Most recent example was on the president's trip to Asia, and we had a negotiation on a pool issue and getting a pool into a, a thing in a certain uh, country, and three or four members of the, were on the other side of the planet, and some of us here and working around the clock with the White House, and they really get the, keep the wheels going around so that we can all do our jobs. I particularly want to thank Christy Parsons. Christy's our vice president this year. Uh, Christy does more work in keeping the pool uh, moving, and we all know what the pool is, and it's the group that gets closest and keeps their eyes on the president. It's sometimes a three-dimensional chessboard, and she does a wonderful job, and she will be our president next year, and we will be in very good hands. Thank you. I want to quickly thank George Lehner. You don't hear George's name a lot. He's our attorney. He works for us uh, pro bono. He is a terrific... George is a terrific First Amendment attorney, and he has, uh, he has been the liaison between us and the rest of the journalism community in some of the work we've done on access, and then will continue on. He's worked with the rest of the media, with journalism schools, such as the Merrill School at the University of Maryland. Our friend Lucy Dalgos, the dean, is with us tonight. George has done a terrific job. Thank you, George. And I want to thank Julie Wisdom. Those of us who've been involved in the association have known Julie Whiston for a long time. This dinner is an epic event and an epic undertaking. We put this dinner on with a paid staff of one, and that's her. And she does it with the help of some friends, her great husband, Dave Whiston, who volunteers and helps us out. We couldn't have this dinner without Julie Whiston. <laughs> this year, I've kept piling extra work on her for the centennial. We've added events, we've added receptions and panels that we normally don't know. We wouldn't have made it to 100 years without Julie Wisdom. <laughs> and I want to thank my peers in the White House Press Corps for this honor. It's been a great thing. I want to take a minute and introduce some people in the room. And I'd like you to stand and then stay standing. And, and, and hold on for a second. I want all the past presidents of the White House Correspondents Association to please stand and stay standing. I'd like. Hold off, hold off. Stay standing. I'd like everyone who's ever been elected or served on our board 
to stand and stay standing. I'd like everyone who covers the beat today, goes to the briefings, goes on the trips, sits in the pool van, to please stand. I'd like everyone who's ever covered a briefing at the White House and worked this beat to please stand. And finally, I'd like our scholarship winners and all the journalism students in the room to please stand. We welcome all our guests to this dinner. There's a lot of attention paid to the people who come here, and we welcome them all, the stars of fashion or sports or, yes, entertainment. But ladies and gentlemen, these are the White House correspondents. These are the people whose name is on the dinner. We referred to it a little bit in the video. Uh, we're going through a, a major and significant change in the media. Uh, first, as you probably noticed from all the old pictures from our founding group, and April referred to it in the, in the video, they were all white men, white presidents too. Uh, now the WHCA, our correspondent association, is half woman, half women. Our board is about half women. We have faces of color. We have new media all over the room. Yahoo is on our board. Olivia Knox from Yahoo News is on our board. This year, for the first time, we added to the press pool a gay newspaper. We have new voices. For the first time ever this year, we had a foreign reporter joining us on Air Force One on a trip. And in our briefing room, if you listen, you'll hear foreign accents asking questions of our government. You'll hear a Russian accent. You'll hear other accents. You won't hear that in a lot of places in the world. This is a very good thing. This is America at its best. Now, there are sometimes very differing views of what this free press can do. There's a noble view. The president referred to Thomas Jefferson in our video, and we share that view. And then sometimes the view of the people from the receiving end of it. I, I found a quote from the late actress Grace Kelly might have summed it up. She said, and I quote, the freedom of the press works in such a way there's not really much freedom from the press. Well, that's true. That's kind of the core of the tension we have here on our beat between the press and the government as we try to keep as many eyes as possible on them. And they don't always want us in the room. This has never been truer than today. A changing media gives us more tools, but also allows the government to send its own images, its own video, its own messages direct to people in ways that we find challenging. It is certainly a thing predecessors to the president would have envied and probably used themselves. That's all fine. We like the White House staff, we like the photographers, we like their video crews. We don't want to kick them out, we just want to be in the room too. We can take the competition. When we are, when we're all paying attention to the government and asking questions, we're all the better for it and it's a bragging point for democracy. I want to turn for a minute and talk a little bit about Harry McAlpin. It was 70 years ago that Harry McAlpin walked into the Oval Office and he was the first black reporter ever to attend and cover a presidential press conference. I'm glad to see you, McAlpin, said Franklin Roosevelt, and very happy to have you here. Not everyone was quite so happy. This association was not at all happy that he walked into the Oval Office. We had denied membership to blacks. We had rigged our rules to make sure they couldn't participate in covering the White House or the president. FDR did that on his own. Tonight, as the video has pointed out, we are announcing and creating a new scholarship, the Harry S. McAlpin Scholarship. <laughs> By dedicating one of our scholarships to him, we not only recognize his historic role, and one we hope will inspire young journalists, we acknowledge our own history. I just want a little more about Harry. Harry went on after his White, years, White House years. As his son said, the White House era was just part of his story. He was a war correspondent in the South Pacific, just at a time when the military was still segregated. He went to law school, he moved to Kentucky, led the NAACP there, marched with Martin Luther King on the state capitol. Harry died in 1985, never having been granted membership in this association. Today, we posthumously grant him the membership. <laughs> Finally, It'll be hard to see, but I want to direct your attention right in the middle of the room, table 104. I want to introduce you to Harry's son, Sherman McAlpin. Sherman, would you please stand? 
Sherman had ma held Martin Luther King's hand in that march on Frankfurt in 1964. He's here with his wife, Joanne, would you please stand, and their daughter, Sasha. Please make them feel welcome. Thank you. Now I'd like to move on and we'll present that and the other scholarships, the other favorite part we all have. To do that, April Ryan will be coming up and being joined by the First Lady, Michelle Obama. Good evening, everyone. What a wonderful evening for the Centennial Scholarship Awards. Are you having a good time tonight? I just found out tonight this lady has jokes, so that's all right. So without further ado, we would like to bring forth our scholarship centennial awardees, and we would like to start with the Harry S. McAlpin Jr. Scholarship. Yes, you may clap, please. It is a one-time award of $7,000. This year's winner is a student from Howard University in Washington, D.C. Let's welcome to the stage Glen Hill of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Once again, Glenn Hill of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Howard University. Now it's time for the White House Correspondents Association Scholarship Prize is a one-time award of $7,000. This year's recipients are two students from Howard University in Washington, D.C., Thema Fenderson of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Victoria Walker of Virginia, Hampton, Virginia. Next, the Deborah Oren Scholarship. The recipients of this year's Deborah Oren Scholarship are two current students from the Medill School of Journalism. Chicago. Chicago, Chi Town, right? Not South Side, right? No. no, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Caroline Cataldo of North Andover, Massachusetts. and Taryn Galbraith of Evanston, Illinois. <laughs> Next, from Columbia University, New York, New York. The White House Correspondents Association awarded a $5,000 tuition grant in 2013 to 2014 to Dina Eid of Cairo, Egypt from Columbia University. Also, the University of Missouri, the White House Correspondents Association supported seven, seven count them graduate students for $2,500 per student to study in Washington, D.C. for a semester as part of the University of Missouri's well-established program. The university waived the balance of the tuition in return. The awardees are Kevin Dubois of Nice, France, <laughs> Anna Boyko Wyrock of Spokane, Washington, Sarah Hawkins of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Yi Man Ning 
of Hong Kong, Nim Tham of Vietnam, Jenny Rice of San Diego, California, and Muling Zhong of China. Now, the White House Correspondents Association supports a student at the Medill School of Journalism through a $5,000 gift towards a postgraduate degree for a student in the government and public affairs reporting track. That goes to Brian De Los Santos of Hayward, California. <laughs> From Northwestern University. The White House Correspondents Association supports a student of the University of California at Berkeley through a $5,000 gift towards a postgraduate degree for a student in the government and public affairs reporting track. That's Jennifer Sh uh, Chase, I think that's Chase, I'm sorry if I'm messing your name up, <laughs> of Sacramento, California. Chase. The University of California at Berkeley. Next, the University of Maryland Philip Morrill College of Journalism, College Park, Simone Thomas. And those are our awardees for this evening. Let's give them a big round of applause. Our centennial awardees for this evening. Have a great evening and laugh hard and a lot. Good job, April. Thank you, April. Thank you, Mrs. Obama. If you have a glass near, I'd like you to raise a glass with me. I'd like to pro propose a toast, our one official toast of the evening, to the President of the United States of America. Long life. And finally, for me, uh, I'd like uh, to introduce the President of the United States by introducing the Vice President of the United States. Selena, what are you doing? Oh, God. I thought you were the president. Hey, listen, are you going to this snorespondence dinner tonight? <laughs> no, I'm not going, man. I've been there once. It's a bunch of politicians trying to explain politics to Hollywood. It's not worth it. Exactly. I mean, who wants to see David Gregory crying in the corner all night? Hey, do you want to come and pick me up? Anybody looking? Just, just check for me. No. Oh, I'm gonna remember that. Oh yeah. Shh, 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 shh. Okay. Oh. Whoa, 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 whoa! No, no! Don't touch the desk. Don't touch the desk. Okay. Okay. Come on, let's get out and get something to eat. Mmm. Yeah. This is good. My granddaughters like the sprinkles. This is like the sweetest thing you can get in the executive branch. Hey guys, what are you doing? Nothing. What's in your mouth? Carrots. Hey, don't tell Joe. Haven't you guys listened to anything I said about healthy eating? Hand it over. Let's hand it over. Yep. You guys, come on, let's move. Okay. Mm. Okay. Busted. Say that again. Oh, this looks good. Mm. Oh, 
I just forgot my purse, so. I'm sure there are raisins in here. Mm. It's a fruit. Plus, it's more than they give you that correspondence dinner, let oh. me tell you. Plus, I work out every day. Yeah, sure you do. I do, too. You want to arm wrestle? I don't really work out. Yeah, I didn't think so. So where are we headed next? Go to the real seat of power. We can write any headline we want. Knock yourself out. <gasps> Go to it. <gasps> the headline I'd like to write is Selena Meyer sworn in as president, but all in good time. Yes, we can all look directly into the camera, Kevin. The point is, you're not supposed to. Selena, hi, Joe. What are you doing here? Getting my tattoo done. You know the difference between a tattoo and the Koch brothers? No. They're both painful, but you can get rid of a tattoo. Ah. All right. I'm in. Bring it on. Oh, yeah. Bring it on. Hey, girl. Hey, J-Dog, are you going to this dinner thing tonight? Well, hell no, I'm not going there. We've got important things going on here in the Capitol. Ooh, yeah, okay, right, thanks. You know what, Joe? I'm gonna need to go to the dinner. You see, the thing is, I'm not really the VP, but you are. I'm an actress from Hollywood. I know. So can you give me a ride? Hey, the Secret Service doesn't let me drive off the property. That makes no sense. You can get a cab. Yeah. I got my dress. And this hair. Thanks a million, Joe. Good luck. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everybody, please have a seat. Have a seat. Um, before I get started, uh, can we get the new presidential set up out here? <laughs> it's worked before. <laughs> That's more like it. It is great to be back. What a year, huh? I usually start these dinners with a few self-deprecating jokes. After my stellar 2013, what could I possibly talk about? <laughs> I admit it, last year was rough. Sheesh. <laughs> at, at one point, things got so bad, the 47% called Mitt Romney to apologize. <laughs> Of course, we rolled out healthcare.gov. That could have gone better. <laughs> In 2008, my slogan was, yes, we can. 
In 2013, my slogan was, Control, Alt, Delete. <laughs> On the plus side, they did turn the launch of healthcare.gov into one of the year's biggest movies. <laughs> but rather than dwell on the past, I would like to pivot to this dinner. Let's welcome our headliner this evening, Joel McHale. On Community, Joel plays a preening, self-obsessed narcissist. So this dinner must be a real change of pace for you. <laughs> I want to thank the White House Correspondents Association for hosting us here tonight. Uh, I am happy to be here, uh, even though I am a little jet-lagged from my trip to Malaysia. The links we have to go to to get CNN coverage these days. <laughs> I think they're still searching for their table. <laughs> MSNBC is here. They're a little overwhelmed. They've never seen an audience this big before. But look, everybody is trying to keep up with this incredibly fast-changing media landscape. For example, I got a lot of grief on cable news for promoting Obamacare to young people uh, on Between Two Ferns. Uh, but that's what young people like to watch. And to be fair, I am not the first person on television between two potted plants. Sometimes I do feel disrespected by you reporters, but that's okay. Seattle Seahawk cornerback Richard Sherman is here tonight, and he gave me he gave me some great tips on how to handle it. Jake Tapper, don't you ever talk about me like that. I'm the best president in the game. What do you think, Richard? Was that good? A little more feeling next time? While we're talking sports, just last month, uh, a wonderful story, an American won the Boston Marathon for the first time in 30 years. <laughs> Which was inspiring, uh, and only fair since a Kenyan has been president for the last six. <laughs> we have to even things out. <laughs> we have some other athletes here tonight, including Olympic snowboarding gold medalist Jamie Anderson is here. We're proud of her. Incredibly talented young lady. Michelle and I watch the Olympics. We cannot believe what these folks do. Death-defying feats. Haven't seen somebody pull a 180 that fast since Rand Paul disinvited that Nevada rancher from this dinner. <laughs> <laughs> As a general rule, things don't uh, end well if the sentence starts, let me tell you something I know about the Negro. <laughs> you don't really need to hear the rest of it. Just a tip for you. <laughs> Don't start your sentence that way. <laughs> Speaking of Rand Paul, Colorado.
Colorado legalized marijuana this year. Uh, an interesting social experiment. Uh, I do hope it doesn't lead to a whole lot of paranoid people who think that the federal government's out to get them and <laughs> listening to their phone calls. That would be a problem. <laughs> and speaking of conservative heroes, the Koch brothers bought a table here tonight, but as usual, they used a shadowy right-wing organization as a front. Hello, Fox News. <laughs> I'm, ju I'm just kidding. Let's face it, Fox, you'll miss me when I'm gone. <laughs> it will be harder to convince the American people that Hillary was born in Kenya. A lot of us really are concerned about the way big money is influencing our politics. I remember when a super PAC was just me buying Marlboro 100s instead of regulars. <laughs> of course, now that it's 2014, Washington is obsessed on the midterms. Folks are saying that with my sagging poll numbers, my fellow Democrats don't really want me campaigning with them. And I don't think that's true, although I did notice the other day that uh, Sasha needed a speaker at career day and she invited Bill Clinton. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was a little hurt by that. <laughs> Both sides are doing whatever it takes to win. It's a ruthless game. Republicans. <laughs> This is a true story. Republicans actually brought in a group of consultants to teach their candidates how to speak to women. This is true. Uh, and I don't know if it'll work with women, but I understand that America's teenage boys are signing up to run for the Senate in droves. <laughs> anyway, while you guys focus on the horse race, I'm going to do what I do. I'm going to be focused on everyday Americans. Just yesterday, I read a heartbreaking letter. Uh, you know, I get letters from uh, folks around the country every day. I get 10 that I read. This, this one got to me. A Virginia man who's been stuck in the same part-time job for years, no respect from his boss, no chance to get ahead. Uh, I, I really wish Eric Cantor would stop writing me. <laughs> You can just pick up the phone, Eric. <laughs> and I'm feeling sorry, believe it or not, for the Speaker of the House as well. These days, the House Republicans actually give John Boehner a harder time than they give me, uh, which means orange really is the new black. <laughs> But I have not given up the idea of working with Congress. In fact, two weeks ago, Senator Ted Cruz and I, we uh, got a bill done together. And, and I have to say, the signing ceremony was something special. Got a picture of it, I think. I, I, look, I know, Washington seems more dysfunctional than ever. Gridlock has gotten so bad in this town, you have to wonder, what do we do to piss off Chris Christie so bad? <laughs> One issue, for example, we haven't been able to agree on is unemployment insurance. Republicans continue to refuse to extend it. Uh, you know what, I, I am beginning to think they've got a point. If you want to get paid while not working, you should have to run for Congress just like everybody else. <laughs> of course, there is one thing that keeps Republicans busy.
they have tried more than 50 times to repeal Obamacare. Despite that, 8 million people signed up for health care in the first open enrollment. Which does lead one to ask, how well does Obamacare have to work before you don't want to repeal it? What if everybody's cholesterol drops one <laughs> What if your yearly checkup came with tickets to a Clippers game? <laughs> not, not the old Don Sterling Clippers, the new Oprah Clippers. <laughs> Would that be good enough? What if it gave Mitch McConnell a pulse? <laughs> what is it going to take? Anyway, this year I've promised to use more executive actions to get things done without Congress. My critics call this the imperial presidency. Truth is, I just show up every day at my office and do my job. I've got a picture of this, I think. <laughs> you would think They'd appreciate a more assertive approach, considering that the new conservative darling is none other than Vladimir Putin. <laughs> Last year, Pat Buchanan said Putin's headed straight for the Nobel Peace Prize. He said this. I, now, I know it sounds crazy, uh, but to be fair, they give those to just about anybody these days. <laughs> so it could happen. But it's not just uh, Pat. Rudy Giuliani said, Putin is what you call a leader. Mike Huckabee and Sean Hannity keep talking about his bare chest, which is kind of weird. <laughs> Look it up, they talk about it a lot. <laughs> It is strange to think that I have just two and a half years left in this office. Um, everywhere I look, there are reminders that I only hold this job temporarily. <laughs> but uh, it's a long time between now and 2016, and anything can happen. You may have heard the other day Hillary had to dodge a flying shoe at a press conference. <laughs> I love that picture. <laughs> Regardless of what happens, I've run my last campaign, and I'm beginning to think about my legacy. Uh, some of you know Mayor Rahm Emanuel recently announced he's naming a high school after me in Chicago, which is extremely humbling. Uh, I was even more flattered to hear Rick Perry, who's here tonight, is doing the same thing in Texas. Take a look. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. It means a lot to me. <laughs> and I intend to enjoy all the free time that I will have. George W. Bush took up painting after he left office, which inspired me to take up my own artistic side. I, I, I'm sure we've got a shot of this. Maybe not. The joke doesn't work without the slide. <laughs> Oh well, <laughs> assume that it was funny. <laughs> does this happen to you, Joel? <laughs> it does, okay. On a more serious note, uh, tonight reminds us that we really are lucky to live in a country where reporters get to give a head of state a hard time on a daily basis, and then once a year give him or her the chance at least to try to return the favor. But we also know that not every journalist or photographer or crew member is so fortunate. Because even as we celebrate uh, the free press tonight, our thoughts are with those in places around the globe, like Ukraine and Afghanistan and Syria and Egypt, who risk uh, everything, in some cases even give their lives, to report the news.
And what tonight also reminds us is that the fight for full and fair access goes beyond the chance to ask a question. Uh, as Steve mentioned, decades ago, an African American who wanted to cover his or her president might be barred from journalism school, burdened by Jim Crow, and once in Washington, banned from press conferences. Uh, but after years of effort, black editors and publishers began meeting with FDR's press secretary, Steve Early. And then they met with the president himself, who declared that a black reporter would get a credential. Uh, and even when Harry McAlpin made history as the first African American to attend a presidential news conference, he wasn't always welcomed by the other reporters. But he was welcomed by the president, who told him, I'm glad to see you, McAlpin, and I'm very happy to have you here. Now, that uh, sentiment might have worn off once Harry asked him a question or two. Uh, and Harry's battles continued, but he made history. And we're so proud of uh, Sherman uh, and his family for being here tonight, and the White House Correspondents Association for creating the scholarship in Harry's name. For over 100 years, even as the White House Correspondents Association has told the story of America's progress, you've lived it too, gradually allowing equal access to women, and minorities, and gays, and Americans with disabilities. And yes, radio and television and internet reporters as well. And through it all, you've helped make sure that even as societies change, our fundamental commitment to the interaction between those who govern and those who ask questions uh, doesn't change. And as Jay will attest, it's a legacy you carry on enthusiastically every single day. Uh, and because this is the 100th anniversary of the Correspondent Association, uh, I actually recorded uh, an additional brief video thanking all of you for your hard work. Can we run the video? Congratulations. Congratulations. What's going on? I, I, I was told this would work. Uh, does anybody know how to fix this? Oh, thank you. You got it? I see it all the time. There. Thank you. Congratulations your work. to the White House Correspondents Association. Here's to 100 <laughs> more terrific years. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. And God bless America, and thank you, Kathleen Sebelius. Ladies and gentlemen, now that he's had the warm-up, Joel McHale. All right, everybody, here we go. I am the last person standing between you and your after party. So in just an hour and 15 minutes, you'll be walking out of here, all right? I'm going to break Jay Leno's record tonight. Strap in, here we go. Good evening, Mr. President, or as Paul Ryan refers to you, yet another inner city minority relying on the federal government to feed and house your family. I'm a big fan of President Obama. I think he's one of the all-time great presidents, definitely in the top 50. Please explain that to Jessica Simpson. You're right, that was low. All right. How about the president's performance tonight, everyone? <laughs> Sir, it, it is, it's amazing that you can still bring it with fresh, hilarious material. And my, uh, <laughs> my favorite bit of yours was when you said you'd close the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay. That was a classic. That was hilarious, <laughs> hilarious. Still going. Um, I'd like to uh, take a moment to recognize the First Lady, Mrs. Obama. You have been very kind to me and my family, especially when you showed us all how to tear a phone book in half with your bare hands. That was, it was incredible. 
I'd also like to thank the White House Correspondents Association for having me and for not being able to book Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> That's true. All right. Um, <laughs> look, um, I know it's been a long night, but I promise that tonight will be both amusing and over quickly, just like Chris Christie's presidential bid. <laughs> I got a lot of these tonight, so uh, buckle up, Governor Christie. Excuse me. Extender buckle up. All right. Um, oh, I deserve that. I, I agree on that one. That You're right on. Now, allow me to tell you a little about myself. My name is Joel McHale. I'm on an NBC show called Community. That's exactly what I thought. I also host a show called The Soup, which is on the E! Network, thank you. <laughs> to Republicans in attendance, E! is the channel that your deeply closeted gay son likes to watch. <laughs> Democrats, it's the same channel that your happy, openly gay son likes to watch. <laughs> e! is also home to the Kardashians, who, believe it or not, are Republicans. And I know that because they're always trying to screw black people. <laughs> yep. Now just the men. Uh, okay. Um, uh, it's an honor to be here tonight at the Washington Hilton. I'm tingling with excitement. Or maybe that's just the bed bugs. I hope you all enjoyed your dinner. The filet tonight was grass-fed beef freshly dragged off the Clive and Bundy Ranch. The steaks are very tasty once you pull off the tiny white hoods. Oh, see, oh, you like Clive and Bundy. Okay, I get it. All right, great. All right, let it be known. Let the record show. All right. Um, tonight's show is being broadcast on C-SPAN. C-SPAN is, uh, yeah, uh, C-SPAN is like one of those paranormal activity movies. It's just grainy shots of empty rooms interrupted by images of people you're pretty sure died a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and stay tuned after the Correspondents' Dinner for an all-new episode of C-SPAN's hit show, So You Think You Can Remain Conscious. <laughs> it's very competitive. Um, this is the 100th year of the White House Correspondents' Association. Yes. 100 years ago, CNN was only searching for the Wright Brothers plane. It's true. Uh, and the Correspondents' Dinner itself is a tradition dating back to 1920. Back then, this event was only for men. It's true. And there's a plaque in the lobby commemorating this as the location of the very first ever Total Sausage Fest. Hashtag Total Sausage Fest. <laughs> but that's all changed. Now America is truly a land of diversity. Only here would you find a black president, a soon-to-be Hispanic majority, and all 19 nationalities contained within Ariana Huffington's accent. <laughs> that was low. Um, I, it's a genuine thrill to be here in Washington, D.C., the city that started the whole crack-smoking mayor craze. <laughs> You guys were the first. I hope he's not here tonight. Um, people say that Toronto Mayor Rob Ford is a clumsy mess, but he can't help it. He's a big guy. He's like a bull in a crack pipe shop. Between Rob Ford, Justin Bieber, and Ted Cruz, you just want to tell Canada, hey, hey, relax. We already have a Florida. <laughs> Ted Cruz proposed a government shutdown to protest the Affordable Care Act, and everyone else in Congress decided to go along with it simply to get some time away from Ted Cruz. <laughs> the Tea Party is anti-socialism and anti-immigration, so it makes sense that their hero is a Cuban from Canada. <laughs> poignant. That one was poignant. Um, the Vice President isn't here tonight, not for security reasons. He just thought this event was being held at the Dulles Airport Applebee's. <laughs> yes, right now, Joe is elbow deep in jalapeno poppers and talking to a construction cone he thinks is John Boehner. <laughs> also true. Um, 
It's crazy to think that Joe Biden is only one heartbeat away from no one taking him seriously as president. <laughs> Sorry for that one. Biden will likely be running for president in 2016, saying, and I quote, there's no obvious reason not to. <laughs> he talks about his motivation for a presidential run as if he's deciding to finish a meatball hoagie. <laughs> hey, it's there, isn't it? Look, all I'm saying, if the bread is toasty and the cheese is warm, I'm gonna finish that thing. <laughs> Jill, bring me my hoagie bib. No, not that one, the fancy one. <laughs> Hillary Clinton has a lot going for her as a candidate. She has experience, she's a natural leader, and as our first female president, we could pay her 30% less. <laughs> That's a saving this country could use. Who's with me? Hillary's daughter Chelsea is pregnant, which means in nine months, we will officially have a sequel to Bad Grandpa. <laughs> It also raises the question, when the baby is born, do you give Pill Clinton a cigar? <laughs> you guys sound like you're on a roller coaster right now. <laughs> There's a heated race on the Republican side. They're all battling to see who will win over the GOP base, and more importantly, who gets to apply turtle wax to Sheldon Adelson's rascal scooter. Jeb Bush says he's thinking about running. Wow, another Bush might be in the White House. Is, is it already time for our every 10 years surprise party for Iraq? <laughs> yes. Um, as it stands right now, the Republican presidential nominee will either be Jeb Bush, Rand Paul, or a bag of flour with Ronald Reagan's face drawn on it. <laughs> Bag of flour. All right. Um, <laughs> people are asking, will Donald Trump run again? And the answer is, does that thing on his head crap in the woods? <laughs> I, I actually don't know. I don't know. I don't know if that thing on his head has a digestive system. So, <laughs> speaking of digestive systems, Chris Christie is here. He's actually here tonight. Wow, sir, you are a glutton for punishment. So here we go. Chris Christie, uh, his administration canceled the train tunnel to Manhattan. They're closing the Pulaski Skyway and they blocked the George Washington Bridge. Finally, a politician willing to stand up to America's commuters. Governor, do you want uh, bridge jokes or size jokes? Because uh, I got a bunch of both. I could go half and half. I know you like a combo platter. Um, now, I get that. I'm sorry for that joke, Governor Christie. I didn't know I was going to tell it, but I take full responsibility for it. Whoever wrote it will be fired. But the buck stops here. So I will be a man and own up to it just as soon as I get to the bottom of how it happened because I was unaware it happened until just now. <laughs> I'm appointing a blue ribbon commission of me to investigate the joke I just told. And if I find any wrongdoing on my part, I assure you, I will be dealt with. <laughs> I just looked into it. It turns out I'm not responsible for it. Justice has been served. going to kill me. <laughs> uh, Mr. President, you're no stranger to criticism. Ted Nugent called you a subhuman mongrel. And it's comments like that which really make me question whether we can take the guy who wrote Wang Dang Sweet Poon Tang seriously anymore. <laughs> Your approval rating has slips. And even worse, you've only got two stars on Yelp. Mitch McConnell said his number one priority was to get the president out of office. So Mitch, congrats on being just two years away from realizing your goal. <laughs> you did it! <laughs> kind of. Mr. President, your harshest critics have compared you to Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, and even Satan. 
And, and I just have to say, those comparisons are outrageous. You look way older than those guys. <laughs> Just because, look, Morgan, Morgan Freeman has played a, a president a few times, that doesn't mean you have to look exactly like him, all right? <laughs> but you are healthy, which is great. Every year, the White House doctor checks the president's colon for polyps and George Clooney's head. <laughs> yeah. It's good to see that White House press secretary and boy detective Jay Carney is here. <laughs> it's a big night for Jay. I haven't seen him this nervous since the president told him, look, just go out there and tell them the website's broken. They'll understand. <laughs> that actually probably was a moment. Um, <laughs> Mr. President, you have to admit, and you already have, the launch of healthcare.gov was a disaster. It was so bad. It was bad. <laughs> Look, I, I don't even have an analogy because the website is now the thing people use to describe other bad things. <laughs> they say stuff like, ugh, I shouldn't have eaten that sushi. I was up all night, healthcare.gov. <laughs> ugh. Boy, that latest Johnny Depp movie really healthcare.gov to the box office. <laughs> Oh, look at my new rug. Did the dog's healthcare.gov on it? You can't get healthcare.gov out of shag. <laughs> but thanks to Obamacare, or as the president refers to it, me care, <laughs> millions of newly insured young Americans can visit a doctor's office and see what a print magazine actually looks like. <laughs> That's awesome. Now over 8 million people have signed up for Obamacare, which sounds impressive until you realize Ashley Tisdale has 12 million Twitter followers, so <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, there's a lot going on in the world. Right now, there's a madman who's had plastic surgery running around annexing small countries in Eastern Europe, and all I keep thinking is, what the hell is Bruce Jenner doing in Crimea? <laughs> Did they even get that show there? Uh, but sir, I do think you're making a big mistake with Putin. You have to show a guy like that that you're just as crazy as he is. He invades Crimea, you invade Cancun. <laughs> Russia takes back the U Ukraine, America takes back Texas. Something to think about. <laughs> Julia Pearson, the new director of the Secret Service, is here tonight. Yeah. Under her leadership, Secret Service agents no longer consort with prostitutes thanks to their new Too Drunk to Make It to the Brothel program. <laughs> I'm sure she loves that. Um, the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, is here. Finally, I can put a face to the mysterious voice clearing its throat on the other end of the phone. <laughs> it was weird. And, um, you know, to prepare for tonight, uh, I've been watching a lot of cable news. I am a big fan of that lesbian on MSNBC, Chris Hayes. He's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. MSNBC is a confusing place. I mean, Al Sharpton is their skinny guy. <laughs> and CNN is desperately searching for something they've been missing for months, their dignity. <laughs> totally. That was just that table. Uh, at this point, CNN is like the Radio Shack in a sad strip mall. You don't know how it stayed in business this long. You don't know anyone that shops there. And they just fired Piers Morgan. Thank you. Um, Fox News is the highest rated network in cable news. Yeah. I can't believe your table's pushed off that far. Um, <laughs> and it's all thanks to their key demographic, the corpses of old people who tuned into Fox News and haven't yet been discovered. <laughs> Former Inside Edition host Bill O'Reilly is not here. He did host that. <laughs> Bill's got another book coming out soon, so he's making his ghostwriters work around the clock. 
Mask. Bill O'Reilly, Megyn Kelly, and Sean Hannity are the Mount Rushmore of keeping old people angry. <laughs> this event brings together both Washington and Hollywood. The relationship between Washington and Hollywood has been a long and fruitful one. You give us tax credits for film and television production, and in return, we bring much-needed jobs to hard-working American cities like Vancouver, <laughs> Toronto, and Vancouver again. <laughs> Hollywood helps America by projecting a heroic image to the rest of the world. We just released another movie about Captain America, or as he's known in China, Captain Who Owes Us $1.1 trillion. <laughs> There's a lot of celebrities here tonight. They're the ones that don't look like ghouls. <laughs> look around. The cast of Veep is here. That's a series about what would happen if a Seinfeld star actually landed on another good show. <laughs> I, I like the new adventures of old Christine, I swear. I just, um, the folks from Duck Dynasty had a very challenging year. The grandfather on that show made homophobic and racist comments. But people are overlooking another issue. He really hates ducks. <laughs> House of Cards has had a huge impact on Washington. What a great show. I haven't seen a Southern Senator give a tour de force performance like that since Lindsey Graham played Blanche Dubois in A Streetcar Named Desire. <laughs> and Lindsey, if you're here now, you can drop character anytime, man. Oh my. Um, and I'm not gonna spoil the shocking twist on House of Cards. But just know that it was so surprising that Nancy Pelosi's face almost changed expression. <laughs> Did you like that one, Nancy? I can't tell. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to congratulate Jared Leto, who was here tonight on his Oscar, and to the Republican senator who asked to be introduced to, quote, that hot chick from Dallas Buyers Club. <laughs> you are in for a very interesting evening. <laughs> Richard Sherman uh, has already had an impact on tonight's event. He's intercepted all three of Tim Tebow's attempts to pass the dinner rolls. Oh, and, and Russell Wilson is also here from my, my Super Bowl champion Seattle Seahawks. Peyton Manning, he wanted to be here tonight, but he can only move four yards at a time. So you're right, he's not here to defend himself. Um, Legendary actor Robert De Niro is here tonight, everyone. Now, I don't do a De Niro impression, but I do an impression of Robert De Niro's agent. You ready? Here it is. Ready? Ring, ring. He'll do it. <laughs> Mr. De Niro, I was in Spy Kids 4, so clearly I'm beyond reproach, so. <laughs> so I will see you on the set of Spy Kids 5, I'm sure. Um, Biz Stone, the founder of Twitter, is here. So if any of you congressmen want to cut out the middleman, just show him your penis. <laughs> Not now! Are you nuts? Okay, those are my warm-up jokes. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I, uh, I, I'm kidding. I wanna leave you tonight with a bit of a pep talk. America has seen her share of challenges, uh, but as my agents told me when I booked an NBC sitcom, hey, things could be worse. <laughs> now, have you watched the news? I mean, not, not CNN, I mean like the real news? It's pretty bad in other places. By comparison, America is doing great. I mean, this year, after months of heated debate and controversy, we achieved something that will impact the health of millions. We brought back Twinkies. <laughs> and we're no longer the fattest country in the world. Now Mexico is. But don't worry, we'll be number one again as soon as they all come over here. <laughs> and what's our biggest concern as Americans? TV show spoilers. In other countries, a, a spoiler consists of, hey, I haven't been back to the village yet, so don't tell me who survived the drone strike. No spoilers. <laughs> Sorry about that one. 
America still has amazing technological innovations. Google Glass has hit the market. Now, just by walking down the street, we'll know exactly who to punch in the face. <laughs> in America, we see gluten and peanuts as threats to our kids. In other countries, gluten and peanut are the nicknames of warlords who have child armies, so we're better. Um, America is doing just fine, guys. How do I know that? Because we're making a fourth movie about trucks that turn into giant robots. And why are they making a Transformers 4? Because there's still so much story left to tell. <laughs> So chin up everyone, this country is still number one in the all-important categories of cream-filled pastries, face computers, and robot trucks. <laughs> Education, the economy, and the environment, hey, we'll get them next time. <laughs> and here's why America is the best country in the world. A guy like me can stand before the president, the press, and Patrick Duffy, <laughs> and tell jokes without severe repercussions. Instead of being shipped off to a gulag, I'm going to the Vanity Fair after party. <laughs> That's right, this is America where everyone can be a pussy riot. <laughs> this is one of the coolest things that has ever happened to me ever in my entire life. Thank you, Mr. President, thank you, Mrs. Obama, and thank you, White House Correspondents' Dinner, and thank you, C-SPAN viewer. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Now, to bring our evening to a close, I'd like you all to remain here for a moment or two while Christy Parsons, our next president, escorts President Mrs. Obama from our, from our hall. Thank you. Well,